Welcome everyone. My name is Grace DeLeon, Associate Brand Manager at Novos. I'll be your host for today's event. As we all enter, I would love to know what part of the world you're calling in from. Feel free to type in the chat box where you're currently located. Awesome, we have a global audience today. I see people calling in from Houston, the United Kingdom, upstate New York. I myself am calling in from Nevada. All right, we're gonna let a few more people join in and then we'll get started. All right, thank you all for joining us. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. First off, I want to thank those of you who have submitted questions already. During the event, you could submit more questions in the Q&A box. If you see a question you like, you can upvote it, and at the end of the presentation, we will begin the Q&A. We will record and share this event barring technical difficulties. Okay, everyone, it's time to get started. I'm delighted to introduce you to Novo's Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Verber. He will be our presenter for today. Dr. Verber is a longevity biotechnology specialist and pioneer of nutrigerontology. He ponders questions about aging, evolution, and the nature of humanity on a regular basis. As a medical doctor, author of four books, singularity faculty member, and partner at $100 million longevity fission fund, Dr. Verber has invested his life into looking for answers to improve health and slow down aging. Dr. Verber and our CEO, Chris, created Novos, a nutraceutical company with some of the world's top longevity scientists and medical doctors that helps people take control of their health spans and lifespans. All right, welcome, Dr. Verber. Great, thank you for a great introduction. And uh, everyone, thank you for uh, being here. For uh, this other uh, seminar, we had a great time during our previous seminar when we were talking about ways uh, uh, to live longer, and we had great questions. So I uh, very much look forward to your questions at the end of uh, this uh, short introduction, about 40 minutes, about how to take supplements properly. And uh, before we start, very quickly a disclaimer, this is not medical advice, uh, so always consult first with a health expert that knows your specific situation and that uh, ideally is well-versed in the science of supplements, nutrition, and prevention. So to start, a few words about supplements. Um, first of all, supplements, their importance is often uh, underestimated, which is very unfortunate because we believe that supplements are very uh, important for health and uh, longevity, but they are often underestimated by the general public and by medical doctors, for example. Um, regarding medical doctors, often they do underestimate the importance of supplements because it's not really taught at most medical schools. Um, so often it's just a very tiny part uh, in your uh, curriculum and uh, sometimes it's not even mentioned whatsoever. And that's a big problem because uh, uh, the supplements being unknown or the science around them being unknown makes uh, them uh, unbeloved, unfortunately. So that's uh, a big problem. And that's also why a lot of patients are on their own when they want to pick the best supplements and the best ways to take them. And actually it should be taught more at medical school because supplement science is very complex. Uh, it's, it's, uh, if you want to do it good, if you want to do it properly, and you have to take a lot of different things into account. And uh, I will explain the most important ones during this talk, during this lecture, but it's a very complex science if you want to do it properly. Another issue or aspect about supplements is that there are a lot of mixed studies about them. And that's also one of the reasons why uh, quite a lot of medical doctors uh, that are often not well versed in, in the science of supplements uh, uh, have some, let's say, reservations about supplements because they will quote some uh, studies that don't show any effect of supplements. There are, of course, uh, studies that do show uh, very interesting effects of supplements on health and so on, but there are a lot of mixed studies. Um, and um, some studies show no effect whatsoever, especially with multivitamins. And uh, that should not actually come as a surprise because a lot of studies are actually not properly conducted. So they are not long enough. Uh, they are too late. Uh, you give the supplement too late. Uh, it's, you give the supplement in the right, uh, not in the right combination, not in the right form, and so on. So that's a big problem. For example, take Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there are some trials giving people uh, B vitamins for Alzheimer's disease, but they give it uh, already when people have Alzheimer's disease. 
but actually the disease starts often decades before you get the first conspicuous symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah? So when you're 17, you get uh, the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Often the disease already started when you, uh, when you were in your 50s. So like 10, 15, 20 years earlier. So if you give supplements at the end of the disease process, um, it's of course not going to make a big impact. And then often they give people these supplements for three months or five months. And then often you don't uh, see any effect, of course not, because it's way too little or way too late. Uh, um, so be very skeptical about those studies. Uh, luckily there are better conducted studies, but uh, they are uh, unfortunately very rare because as I mentioned, supplement science is quite complex. Then we have the government recommendations, and that's also a, a big problem in the sense that uh, a lot of the government advice is outdated and based on very crude scientific methods uh, to see how the minimum amount you need is often not the optimal amount for optimal long-term health. So that, that's another issue. And then uh, finally, uh, there is a whole debate uh, between healthy foods versus supplements. A lot of people say or believe and that's one of the misunderstandings we will discuss during this presentation about supplements is that if you eat healthy, you don't need supplements. But we think that's a big, uh, uh, let's say, underestimation of uh, or underestimate of the importance of supplements. So we'll come back to that later and uh, we will try to demonstrate why we believe uh, it's more complicated than that. So before we further continue, very quickly, some definitions. Uh, first of all, uh, I will talk a lot about micronutrients. Micronutrients are vitamins, minerals, or other substances that the body needs to function properly. So it's things like magnesium, zinc, omega-3, vitamin A, vitamin C. These are all micronutrients. Uh, micronutrients are uh, things that provide energy, that uh, provide calories. These are things like uh, amino acids, so proteins, um, fats, and carbs. So these are micronutrients, and then the micronutrients are the vitamins, minerals, and so on. And then finally, a very important definition is the difference between health supplements and longevity supplements. So health supplements actually are supplements that don't really extend lifespan if you take extra of them, but they do shorten lifespan if you don't have enough of them. Um, so these are most well-known supplements like vitamin K, omega-3 fatty acids, iodine, calcium. Uh, so if you give extra to, of those supplements to animals, they don't really live longer. But if you're deficient in them, it can shorten lifespan and uh, significantly increase your risk of uh, aging related uh, diseases. So they're very important nonetheless. And then you have longevity supplements. These are supplements that can extend lifespan because they work on uh, fundamental aging mechanisms. These are things like alpha ketoglutarate, fisetin, glycine, pterostilbene, and so on. Um, so during the presentation, the first part will be mostly about health supplements. And then in the final part of the presentation, we will go more in depth into what are the most interesting longevity supplements. So let me first start with some common misconceptions or misunderstandings about supplements. And the first one is a lot of people believe that they don't see, need supplements because they eat a healthy diet. That's something you very often hear. It's also what a lot of governments say. If you eat healthy, you don't need supplements. But we think it's much more complicated than that. First of all, nature didn't make humans to properly absorb all nutrients for a long, healthy life. So that's a very important uh, insight or nuance. Uh, actually, um, the human body is not very well designed um, to properly absorb nutrients. Um, it's a big problem, but for uh, thousands of years, we actually have suffered with iron deficiency because our bodies are not very good in absorbing iron. If you compare it to a lot of other species or fish or plants, they are much better able to absorb iron from the environment. Iodine deficiency has been uh, a problem for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, actually, until very recently still, uh, until uh, governments decided to add iodine to bread and, and salt, which is uh, not enough, as we will explain, but it uh, mitigated the worst, uh, the most worst uh, symptoms or diseases caused by iodine deficiency, like uh, children born with severe mental uh, retardation because the mother was iodine deficient. But that doesn't mean that uh, the amounts that the government currently recommends uh, are enough. So we'll talk about that later. So just know that our body is not very well made to absorb all these nutrients, also because evolution and, and nature cannot think uh, in the long term. So it just wants, it developed our bodies to stick around for a few decades to uh, hunt and find food and reproduce, 
but it doesn't think in the long term, like what, uh, what would be needed for optimal longevity and health, because in prehistoric times, people actually didn't get the chance to become very old. So, um, so that's uh, one of the reasons why our bodies are not very well designed to absorb all nutrients properly. A second reason is that our food today uh, is very different compared uh, to prehistoric times. Uh, so it, these are micronutrient poor, calorie rich Frankenstein foods, and they lack a lot of micronutrients. They lack a lot of vitamins and minerals. So actually some things in prehistoric times, uh, people did better, uh, like potassium intake was much higher than today. Um, and also intake probably of some other ingredients or micronutrients. Um, but today our foods are often very micronutrient poor, and that's uh, another reason why supplementation is uh, more uh, important than ever. Also, we have a different lifestyle compared to uh, prehistoric times, in the sense that uh, in prehistoric times, um, uh, there was much less stress. Today, we have much more stress. We live much more indoors, so we need more vitamin D. Uh, we, have, uh, we smoke, we have allergies, which need more B vitamins and magnesium. So our current lifestyles, they necessitate actually more micronutrients. Um, also, a big problem is the novel methods of agriculture lead to foods that contain much less micronutrients, like the amounts of copper and magnesium in foods is much lower than even 50 years ago. So that's also a, a reason why supplementation uh, is interesting. Um, another big problem is that the official recommendations that most governments uh, hand out, uh, you need that uh, amount uh, of uh, this vitamin or that mineral per day. Um, they are in many cases too low. Uh, so because the studies they are based on are often outdated old studies done in the 1960s or 50s. And um, they use very crude biomarkers to assess the minimum amount you would need uh, of these micronutrients not to become ill. Uh, but you need to measure that. And uh, it's, it's all often measured in a very crude way. So these amounts that governments um, spread out or recommend are the minimum amount you would need not to become sick very quickly after a few weeks uh, or a few months. Uh, but they don't tell us a lot about the minimum amount you need for a very long, healthy life. Take, for example, vitamin B12. A lot of governments say you need 2.4 micrograms or 4 micrograms, depending on which country you live in, uh, as the minimum amount or the recommended amount you need for vitamin B12, 4 micrograms. But then we see in uh, studies that you actually would need at least 20 micrograms per day uh, to prevent double stand breaks much better of the DNA. Uh, um, and some uh, people, uh, for example, scientists at the University of Oregon, especially if you get older, they, they speculate that people would need at least 50 micrograms of vitamin B12 per day for optimal health. Also, because when you get older, you absorb much less. And that's also something governments don't take into account sufficiently. So be skeptical about these uh, recommendations because medical science is very young, it's still very crude. And a lot of people think that all these values are written in stone and written in the stars and are perfect, perfectly calculated. But there is a lot that we cannot calculate very well in, in the medicine. So be skeptical. Um, and finally, uh, for the, the official recommendations, uh, they also don't look at what's optimal for a long uh, life, uh, for longevity. So sometimes for longevity, you need even higher amounts. So that was the first uh, misconception, uh, that if you eat healthy, you don't need supplements. We don't think so. Secondly, a lot of people say, I don't need supplements because my blood test says I'm healthy. Well, we also have reservations about uh, blood tests. Uh, we do a lot of blood tests uh, ourselves to, to track our health and so on. Uh, but we do think that uh, blood tests have a lot of shortcomings uh, in the sense they are not very good in measuring uh, micronutrient deficiencies. Um, like vitamins, minerals, blood tests are very bad at that, actually. Um, so the tests are not very specific and sensitive, especially for measuring uh, minerals in your blood. Um, so magnesium in your blood or potassium, uh, it doesn't tell a lot about intracellular amounts. Even if you measure uh, it in the uh, red blood cells, it doesn't tell you a lot about the uh, amounts you have intracellular uh, spread throughout your cells in your whole body. Uh, so that's that's one big problem. Uh, another uh, problem is that a lot of uh, uh, these values are actually based on an uh, already sick deficient population. Uh, so our governments or, or recommendations, they say you need that minimum amount. Why? Uh, because that's what everyone has in their blood or, or that's the average. 
But uh, if you live, if you have a population that's vitamin D deficient already, because people sit inside so often, uh, the amounts of vitamin D are actually perhaps uh, not optimal. And we actually see that. We see studies that if vitamin D levels are three times higher than what uh, would be normal according to your blood test, uh, we see much better protection of uh, cardiovascular disease and so on. Uh, or the, that's the amount of vitamin D we see in longevity zones or in zones where there is much more sunlight and so on. Uh, and um, so as another problem is that all of these blood values can fluctuate. So if you measure TSH, for example, a uh, thyroid stimulating hormone to assess your uh, iodine deficiency or thyroid health, um, the problem is with TSA, TSH, it fluctuates a lot. So in the morning can be much lower or higher than in the evening. Um, and also there's a discussion actually, the TSA levels and they say if it's higher than four, uh, you have a, a slow uh, thyroid gland, um, but uh, some uh, scientists, uh, actually a lot of endocrinologists, they think uh, it should be lower, should, should not be four, should be 2.4 or ideally even lower than two. So much lower than what your blood test would uh, consider as normal or abnormal in that in this sense. Um, so just saying there is a lot of discussion and uh, we think that these values on your blood test, be skeptical also about them because as a medical doctor, I can say they are far from perfect. And all too often I hear people saying, my blood test is normal, so I don't need supplements, so I'm healthy, while they look unhealthy and they have increased risk of all kinds of diseases, uh, despite having a perfectly normal blood test. So we have to be also uh, careful about those interpretations. So what would be actually a solution for this? Well, a solution would be just to take uh, all the uh, micronutrients you need continuously uh, to just make sure you're not deficient. And that's actually the best method. Just take all the micronutrients, eat a healthy uh, diet, take on top of that supplements. And that's the only real way to be certain you're not micronutrient deficient. Um, and that leads us to a third misconception. A lot of people think uh, that their supplement will actually work, uh, but, but uh, often it's not really the case, unfortunately, because most food supplements are inadequate, even for basic health. Um, there are a lot of shortcomings with supplements and multivitamins, especially. Um, for example, the doses are way too low. A lot of multivitamins contain uh, 50 milligrams of potassium or 80 milligrams, but you need 2000 milligrams. Uh, actually, you need 4,700 milligrams of potassium per day. You can get some through your food, but uh, even then it's uh, not sufficient. Uh, if you look at uh, the average intake in, in Western societies. So 50 milligrams, is almost nothing. Uh, um, another big problem with uh, most supplements is they use wrong forms of ingredients. Uh, they use magnesium oxide instead of uh, magnesium uh, malate or uh, magnesium glycinate, which would be in better forms. Uh, magnesium oxide is actually a very bad form of magnesium, or at least can be, can be much better because uh, actually magnesium oxide was used as a laxative. Uh, so it stays uh, quite well in the gut and causes good irritation and so on. Um, the same with uh, yeast, uh, selenium methionine is often uh, uh, found in supplements for, to provide selenium, but uh, actually we see that uh, selenium yeast is probably better because selenium yeast contains multiple different forms of uh, selenium uh, than uh, selenium methionine, uh, because uh, selenium methionine supplements only contain uh, one form of selenium, which is uh, selenium methionine. Um, another problem is that a lot of supplements contain synthetic vitamins, uh, for example, uh, for vitamin E, they contain a, a synthetic vitamin E or semi-synthetic vitamin E, which is a problem. We'll come back to that later. Vitamin E is a very complicated uh, uh, supplement, actually. And um, they use strong combinations. So like zinc and copper, uh, they inhibit each other absorption. So you have to dose them in the right proportions and uh, the right amounts. And most supplements don't really do that. And another problem is that a lot of supplements only contain one form of a specific vitamin. Uh, for vitamin E, for example, we know in nature there exist eight different forms of vitamin E, like alpha tocopherol, beta tocopherol, gamma tocopherol, alpha tocotrienol, etc. Most supplements only contain one form of vitamin E, and that's not ideal. Um, and actually, if you take these, this one form of vitamin E, you will uh, inhibit the absorption uh, of the other forms of vitamin E that you would get through your food. So uh, anyway, so it's as you can see, Supplementation is complicated, and if you want to do it properly, it's not easy. And that brings us to the fourth misconception, and that's that a lot of people think that taking a multivitamin is easy, that it suffices. I just pop a multivitamin and I'm covered for the most basic uh, micronutrients. But 
As we just discussed here, most multivitamins, the doses are too low, wrong form, wrong versions of vitamins, and so on. So how can we mitigate this problem? Well, what we like to do is to use a multi-layered approach. Uh, so uh, we call it's a three-layered approach, actually. And the first layer would be to actually still take a multivitamin uh, just to mainly cover your micro, uh, so your micronutrients, especially the nanonutrients, which are the ones you need in small amounts and of which you, the, the doses in most supplements are okay. Uh, so most supplements do contain sufficient amounts of manganese, molybdenum, chromium, and so on. So for that, you would take a multivitamin uh, just to cover those uh, micronutrients that are okay uh, in, a, in the right doses uh, found in supplements. But the problem, as I uh, highlighted with supplements, is that most of them don't contain high enough uh, uh, amounts or doses of uh, different uh, micronutrients. And for that, you need a second layer. So you need to take on top of your multivitamin, ideally individual bulk micronutrients um, that require much higher doses than found in multivitamins. Uh, um, and these are things like magnesium, uh, potassium, as we just discussed, uh, but actually potassium is layer three, as we will explain. Vitamin D. So in most supplements, vitamin D is way too low. It's like 400 micrograms, but you need ideally 4,000 micrograms eh, or 5,000 micrograms. Magnesium is way too low in most supplements, uh, 50 milligrams, while you need hundreds of milligrams per day. Uh, same for iodine, uh, should ideally be much higher than found in most supplements. So that's a second layer. So you would take these individual supplements separately on top of your multivitamin. And then there's a third layer. That means, yeah, you should ideally eat specific foods every day because to get some micronutrients that you can't really find in supplements, at least not in the right form or dose or, and so on. Uh, um, so in a classic example is vitamin E. As I explained, most supplements contain synthetic vitamin E uh, and it's, uh, I, so it's just very difficult to find the proper vitamin E supplement. So just take it through food, uh, through eating uh, almonds and, and sunflower seeds and so on. Uh, same for potassium. Uh, it's uh, really impossible to put in high enough doses in a multivitamin pill. Uh, so take it through potassium salt. So let's, in the next slides, go a little bit deeper uh, into uh, all these layers. So layer one, as I mentioned, um, it would be to take still a multivitamin, but knowing it's far from perfect, uh, to just cover the basics, to cover your molybdenum, manganese, and so on. And uh, some good brands, this is uh, uh, not sponsored, but some, uh, I get, uh, we get a lot of these questions from customers like, hey, which are good multivitamin brands? You can find them on our website, but here are the things like uh, Jarrow, Douglas Labs, Now Foods, Doctors Best, these are good brands. Um, and then always combine your multivitamin with an extra bulk supplement uh, or with, with separate bulk supplements. And that's, second, that's layer two, as I explained. So layer two, uh, what are some examples of bulk uh, micronutrients that are not found in high enough doses in a multivitamin so that you should take separately? Magnesium, very important for health, DNA repair, uh, uh, reducing DNA damage uh, for metabolism, uh, for heart uh, health and so on, muscle health. Um, you need 300 to 500 milligrams per day. Ideally, magnesium malate or magnesium glycinate. Uh, not magnesium oxide. So if you go to the pharmacist or uh, to the drugstore, most magnesium supplements, besides being too low dosed, are magnesium oxide, which is the cheapest form of magnesium, uh, but it's not a, go a good one. So make sure you take magnesium malate or magnesium glycinate, uh, because the malate and the glycinate also have shown to extend lifespan. Um, and by the way, if you take normal score, um, then you don't need to take extra magnesium malate because it's already a sufficient amount in normal score. So just if, if there are any people here uh, taking core that they know this. Secondly, vitamin D, also very important for health and longevity. There are a lot of studies showing that uh, higher vitamin D intakes and levels uh, are associated with significant reduced mortality. Um, but the problem is in most multivitamins, it's way too low. And what governments recommend is also actually way too low. A lot of uh, vitamin D experts say we need much more. And uh, one of the reasons why governments don't recommend uh, much more vitamin D intake is that uh, everyone then would need to take vitamin D supplements. So that's one of their arguments. Like, yeah, it's uh, 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 that's not good because then everyone has to take these supplements. And but yeah, I mean that's a weird uh, uh, argument, in my opinion. And actually, a lot of uh, uh, endocrino endocrinologists, including the American uh, Endocrinologist Society, have been advocating for a very long time um, to consume much higher levels of vitamin E than well, uh, vitamin D 
than what governments uh, recommend. Another important bulk uh, micronutrient you should take separately to have higher levels is vitamin K2. It's very important for uh, cardiovascular health to reduce calcification of the arteries, for example. It also improves mitochondrial health. Um, and um, it, it's just a very interesting uh, uh, nutrient. Uh, and ideally, you take 180 to around 360 micrograms, and so much higher than in most supplements. Then B vitamins, also very important for metabolism, brain health, and so on. There are a lot of studies showing that if you take uh, different B vitamins, uh, you have uh, reduced brain shrinkage, but only on the condition you uh, use at least enough B vitamins, not just one or two, because some studies just give vitamin B12 and vitamin B6 uh, to study brain aging, and then it doesn't work. Why? Of course, because you need many other B vitamins that work synergistically with those B vitamins. So very weird that sometimes million dollar trials are run in such a bad way. Uh, but we do see in trials, if you use uh, more B vitamins, uh, that we do see some uh, uh, reduced brain shrinkage and brain aging and so on. So that's a B vitamin complex. So it contains all B vitamins, B, vitamin B1, B2, B3, B6, B12, etc. And uh, ideally you take it in amounts that's a little bit higher, like a few times higher than what governments recommend, than the uh, recommended daily allowance at the RDA. Um, phosphatidylcholine, it's a bit of forgotten B vitamin, uh, as I like to call it. It's uh, uh, also very important for brain health, but also for longevity. Um, for many reasons, it's incorporated into the membranes uh, in the brain. It's needed for liver health too, and metabolism. Actually, we see a lot of fatty liver disease in, in the West. And one of the reasons is that uh, we don't consume enough uh, choline or phosphatidylcholine. Uh, we've seen a lot of studies uh, that uh, phosphatidylcholine can mitigate uh, fatty liver disease significantly. Uh, of course, we get fatty liver because of our uh, unhealthy diet, and that contains way too many carbs and uh, animal proteins and unhealthy fats. Uh, but uh, a deficiency in phosphatidylcholine uh, could also play uh, a role in the fatty liver disease. And uh, it's also important for brain health and, uh, and, and so on. So it's a very interesting, uh, often forgotten and ignored uh, supplement um, or ingredient that you don't find uh, in most uh, supplements, unfortunately. Then omega-3 fatty acids, also very important. Uh, recently, there was a study that showed a significant reduction in cancer if people just did uh, three simple things. We actually posted the study on our Instagram account, but uh, one of the three things was consuming uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, the other was consuming vitamin D and uh, doing a little bit of exercise at home, and that uh, led to a significant reduction of cancer in elderly people by just doing these three simple things. But uh, there are many other studies showing the importance of omega-3 fatty acids for our health. And ideally you take a high enough dose, like 1,500 milligrams. Um, so some studies use 300 milligrams of omega-3 and then they say, oh, it doesn't work. Yeah, of course not, because the dose is so low. You need uh, at least 1,500 milligrams and the right form of omega-3. And that's the next slide. So because it's also complicated omega-3 uh, supplements, speech form and so on. Um, then calcium, often way too low dose in supplements. So ideally you take it separately. Uh, it's very important you always combine calcium intake with vitamin D for absorption of calcium and vitamin K to make sure the calcium ends up in your bones and not in your blood vessel walls where it could contribute to calcification. So it's very important to take high enough dose, uh, to take not a, a too high dose of uh, calcium, like 1,200 milligrams or more in one go, because then you have a too high of a calcium peak in your blood, which can contribute to uh, calcification. And uh, to mitigate that, make sure you always take around 500 milligrams of calcium in one go, not 1,200 milligrams, as has been some, sometimes delivered in studies or given in studies, and combine it always with vitamin K, which is very important to make uh, sure that the calcium ends up in your bones and not in your blood vessels, as I mentioned before. Iodine also uh, an ingredient often underestimated uh, in supplements. It's often not enough. So uh, ideally we see you need much higher doses of iodine to really feel an effect. So we see that if people take uh, eight times more iodine than what governments recommend, uh, the uh, iodine recommendation is 150 micrograms per day, but a, more, a lot of people take 150 micrograms per day, they don't really feel an effect. Uh, but if they take around thousand micrograms of iodine per day, they feel a big effect. They have much more energy. They can think more clearly. They can remember their dreams much better. They have uh, warm hands and warm feet, finally, after decades. Um, so we believe uh, that the amount of iodine that governments recommend 
uh, is too low. It's, it's just enough to prevent severe problems, as I mentioned before, like children born with cretinism, uh, mental retardation, or uh, having other big problems. But uh, is that uh, high enough of a dose for an optimal long life? So, um, and uh, we believe uh, the doses should be higher. And actually, around 1,000 micrograms per day is what we see in, uh, in longevity zones, like in Okinawa, they eat a lot of seaweed. And uh, the average intake is uh, uh, one to uh, milligram or 1,000 to 2,000 micrograms uh, per day. So it's what uh, uh, some people uh, eat regularly in, uh, in Japan, for example. And then uh, the other, uh, let's say, table. Uh, these are things that often are still contained in your supplement, but sometimes not. I like vitamin A, make sure it's enough in your multivitamin uh, that you don't need to take it separately, like the other ones I just discussed. Copper, often multivitamins do contain copper, so probably you don't have to take it extra, but uh, make sure. Iron, uh, some multivitamins do contain enough. If not, take some extra, especially women who uh, are much more uh, prone uh, or susceptible to iron deficiency. Sometimes it can help to take a little bit extra iron, uh, like 50 milligrams extra on top of the other 50 milligrams. But don't overdo iron because too much iron can cause oxidation and so on. Uh, but too little is also not good. Um, and then uh, finally, zinc. Uh, often multivitamins do contain zinc. If not, or not uh, in high enough doses, do take it separately. Uh, and uh, make sure you always combine it with copper in the sense uh, uh, the the need each other. Of course, uh, don't combine it literally because zinc in, can inhibit somewhat absorption of copper and vice versa. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you do it in the right ratio, uh, then it's quite okay. Uh, on average, you need eight times more copper, uh, more zinc than copper. So this was the second layer. Now let's uh, quickly discuss uh, one aspect of that. And uh, these are omega-3 fatty acid supplements. Um, so what we actually see is that the uh, omega-3 supplements, it's quite uh, uh, interesting science. So we have two animal-based forms of omega-3, DHA and EPA. Um, that's what you probably all know. Um, but there are also four important forms of omega-3. And that, that's here where it really gets interesting. Um, we have the triglyceride form of omega-3, which is often found in fish and in algae. Um, so it's a triglyceride, as you can see below. Uh, so it, it's a triglycerol backbone with uh, uh, DHA, uh, three DHA tails on it, for example. And, but then you have the ethyl ester form. It's more already processed omega-3 in the sense that uh, it doesn't have the triglycerol backbone. It has the individual, uh, let's say, uh, tails. Um, and then you have the phospholipid form, which is uh, found in krill. And that's also very interesting because uh, the structure of that fat is a bit different and can also enable some uh, additional health effects to, to its choline group and so on. And then you have the lysophosphatidyl choline forms of omega-3s. And they are mainly found in eggs of uh, fish, like uh, herring roe, lumpfish roe, salmon roe, caviar uh, roe, or little eggs of fish. Uh, everyone knows caviar, of course. These are uh, this is a row from uh, a specific fish called st the sturgeon, very expensive. But uh, you have much cheaper uh, caviar-like fish eggs, uh, like herring roe and lumpfish roe. You can buy them in most supermarkets, and um, they look uh, like uh, caviar, like uh, herring roe or uh, lumpfish roe. And they are very dense in uh, lysophosphatidylcholine uh, omega trees. And they, uh, these omega trees can penetrate the brain much better. Uh, so they have done studies. In mice, for example, where they give triglyceride forms of DHA, and they don't really see an improvement in brain health or cognition in these mice, but then they give uh, the lysophosphatidylcholine form of omega-3s, and uh, they see that these omega-3s enter the brain uh, of these mice, uh, the brains much better, and uh, these mice also perform cognitively much better uh, compared to mice taking uh, the triglyceride form of uh, DHA. So it's very interesting. And uh, what I actually, to make a long story short, because I can talk for hours about uh, uh, omega-3s and, and the science behind it, but to give you practical advice, ideally consume the triglyceride form of supplements, which is a more natural form. Uh, there's some discussion, triglyceride versus ethyl ester. They don't see a difference, but often it's more nuanced. Um, uh, so the triglyceride form, why do we recommend it? Because it's a natural form. It's, uh, it's uh, as you eat it in fish. Uh, and uh, perhaps the backbones are a bit interesting. In the end, if you absorb it, it's processed in a way that you also create 
uh, uh, you get rid of the backbones. For, but anyway, we do think the triglyceride form is the most interesting one, ideally with also phospholipid omega-3s. And there are some brands that offer that. Again, this is not sponsored, but uh, Nordic Naturals is one that offers uh, triglyceride omega-3 and phospholipid omega-3 in one supplement, uh, which is uh, interesting. Then combine this still with fish roe, because uh, most uh, supplements do not contain lyso or phosphatidylcholine. And ideally, you take it with fish roe because it contains so many other healthy substances. So consume for breakfast feed four times per week fish roe. Uh, you can put it on your toast or, uh, or add it to other stuff. Um, and uh, it's a great way to get those very brain penetrant omega 3s, uh, which are very important for brain health, of course. And then still eat fatty fish four times per week. Uh, so even despite taking supplements, uh, do take uh, do regularly consume fatty fish because in the fatty fish there are also other substances like fluoranic acids and so on and many other healthy things. And fatty fish is a great alternative for red meat and so on. So uh, still consume fatty fish regularly uh, and uh, combine it with fish roe and um, triglyceride form uh, supplement based omega trees. So we discussed layer two. Let's have quickly discuss layer three. So it means specific foods uh, because uh, to, to get specific ingredients because it's so difficult to find uh, all the micronutrients in uh, sufficiently high doses uh, in uh, uh, or in the proper form. Uh, so vitamin E would mean, um, as I mentioned, vitamin E is often uh, found in the synthetic form in supplements. It's like a, a tocopherol succinate, which is a very, uh, it's actually a pro-oxidant. Uh, so it's very weird that they, I use that form, but anyway, and um, so ideally try to get as much natural omega uh, vitamin E as possible through eating uh, sunflower seeds, which are very rich in uh, vitamin E, uh, hazelnuts and almonds. Uh, there are also vitamin E rich, rich foods like avocado and green leafy vegetables, but still often they don't, do not contain enough uh, vitamin E, uh, or you uh, really have to eat a lot of them. Uh, then, as I mentioned, uh, for to get the lyso phosphatidylcholine based omega 3s, consume fish roe. Um, and then finally, potassium, also very important, often underestimated as an electrolyte. Uh, we will soon publish uh, an extensive blog post about uh, potassium intake, but try to consume it uh, through uh, using potassium salt um, on top of, uh, of your food. Uh, to get at least two grams of extra potassium uh, per day. Uh, it's very important for general health, nerve conduction. People also taking more potassium often feel calmer, they have less ADD, etc. So we think that uh, uh, potassium is very important. And we will publish a blog post, as I mentioned, soon about this. All righty, so you, there's a lot of information. So you can find uh, concrete uh, advice, uh, sorry, in, in, uh, in, in this regard. So I think... Uh, uh, I don't know whether you still can see my uh, presentation or not. Um, I think it's uh, it got lost my presentation. Um, so let's let's quickly delve it up again. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen uh, again. Um, a moment, please. Okay. So um, okay, I'm going to just skip to the. Uh, our slides, where we were, my apologies. I, I just uh, hit my mouse and uh, a lot of things went wrong, but here is the slide we were at. So to summarize this, and you can also find this on our website. Um, this is a concrete example of how to take your supplements and, and how to combine them. And to take those supplements on top of uh, specific foods to increase your vitamin E intake, uh, on top of uh, potassium chloride based salt, and fish roe and so on. Um, and combine this always with a healthy diet, a healthy longevity diet. As we explain also on our website, you can find a novel longevity diet and you can also download the poster and it uh, can explain to you in very quickly, it's one, in one glance, you can see how to replace unhealthy food with uh, healthier alternatives. And then uh, finally, very quickly uh, to end the presentation because we have to be mindful of our time, uh, a quick word about uh, uh, lifespan supplements. So uh, longevity supplements. So we just talk mainly about micronutrients, but actually giving extra micronutrients doesn't really extend lifespan. If you're deficient in them, it can shorten lifespan. So it's still important to take longevity supplements on top of that. Longevity supplements, very quickly, some examples. Um, these are things like alpha-ketoglutarate. Uh, this is a molecule that occurs naturally in your body. 
um, but the uh, amount declines during aging. And it's uh, important for all kinds of aspects for mitochondrial health, collagen production, epigenetic maintenance. And uh, studies show that if you uh, uh, add, add, give animals AKG, they live longer in different species. Um, it can also reduce hair graying and hair loss in mice uh, and can improve uh, the epigenome, mitochondrial health, and so on. And um, yeah, AKG is a very interesting uh, longevity molecule with a lot of science behind it. Uh, for example, below you see two, you see two graphs. Uh, the one on your left is uh, C. elegans, so little worms given uh, AKG, they live significantly longer, so it uh, are the red lines compared to the control group that doesn't get AKG. And on the right, you see a, a graph in a study done in mice, for example, uh, where uh, mice when given AKG live uh, longer. And also, interestingly, uh, various health biomarkers also improve in these mice. Especially, for example, uh, loss of fur color. Uh, so um, we see in, in these mice that their, their fur stays uh, black uh, longer. So hair graying is uh, reduced and baldness is also reduced. So very interesting uh, uh, supplement. Another example is fisetin. Uh, fisetin has also shown to extend lifespan in multiple species, uh, in multiple studies. Uh, it can improve cognition and memory. Um, and it impacts uh, longevity or aging in various ways. Uh, it can reduce cellular senescence, especially in higher doses. In lower doses, and we find that actually the most important aspect, not its analytic activity, but in lower doses, it can reduce inflammation. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, fisetin um, has uh, interesting therapeutic activity in, uh, in mice and human tissues, and that administration of fisetin um, can uh, restore tissue homeostasis, aging-related uh, pathology, and extend both medium uh, and very importantly, maximum lifespan. So very interesting uh, ingredient. So found in strawberries and in nature, uh, but uh, uh, in these studies, uh, larger amounts are, are of course uh, provided to enable these effects. Um, a quick word about glycine, another example of a longevity supplement, uh, can uh, increase lifespan, um, has various health benefits, uh, including in humans, and um, yeah, has uh, epigenetic effects among many others. Uh, so they have done also clinical trials with glycine to improve blood sugar levels and, and so on. A very interesting substance. And it's uh, an interesting, uh, let's say, amino acid. Uh, as I mentioned, it occurs naturally in our body too, but uh, during aging levels decline. And actually we see that low glycine levels in the blood are correlated with higher risk of heart disease uh, and uh, mortality. Um, and we see if you give animals uh, glycine, uh, they live a little bit longer. There are studies showing uh, bigger effects uh, than here, uh, but uh, we do know that uh, glycine has uh, various health benefits in animals and in humans, uh, including improving epigenetics, uh, especially in, uh, of the mitochondrial DNA, for example. And then um, another example is uh, a substance called glucosamine, which is very well known for uh, improving joints, but not a lot of people know it can also extend lifespan and act on aging and uh, via various ways, and then just providing healthy joints. Uh, so it can improve mitochondrial biogenesis, so more mitochondria are created and can induce autophagy, which is the maintenance of, uh, of the cells uh, through digestion of uh, cellular waste that otherwise accumulates during aging. Um, and we see actually in humans that one of the very little uh, supplements associated with reduced mortality is glucosamine. Uh, so when scientists look, looked at dozens of supplements, they uh, mainly found only uh, glucosamine was one of the very few uh, supplements that uh, were, uh, was strongly associated with uh, reduction in mortality uh, in humans and also a reduction in heart disease in humans. Uh, so that's very interesting. And we know if you give it to animals, uh, then uh, we see that uh, these animals live longer. Uh, uh, for example, this is a study done in mice where uh, mice are given glucosamine and we also see some lifespan effects. And it's also uh, yeah, a very well-known uh, supplement taken already for a very long time to improve joint health, but uh, it's much more interesting in, uh, in many ways. So a quick overview of those longevity supplements. Um, we just uh, touched on a few of them. Um, all of them are contained in OvoScore. Uh, we don't talk about these supplements because uh, they are in OvoScore. No, we put them in OvoScore because they're so interesting and they have so much science uh, behind them. And we believe these are uh, some of the most interesting uh, longevity supplements with the most science uh, behind them. And uh, by this, uh, I will end. I will just one minute very quickly talk about supplements for skin health. It's very easy, actually, because a lot of supplements that are healthy for skin are also good for longevity. 
uh, like uh, glucosamine sulfate, we just discussed this, glycine, AKG, uh, they do not only extend lifespan, but uh, an act on fundamental aging processes, but they are also, uh, interestingly, they can also improve skin health and reduce wrinkles and so on. Uh, uh, you have hyaluronic acid, uh, which also reduces wrinkles, even if you take it orally, as you can see in the study below, you can see the wrinkle uh, surface area. Um, so it uh, declines when uh, glucose uh, hyaluronic acid is given uh, orally. And uh, collagen also can uh, reduce wrinkles when taken orally because uh, yeah, it's broken down in individual pieces and it's, uh, these pieces still end up in the bloodstream. And uh, make sure you take uh, brands, uh, or let's say if you take collagen to reduce wrinkles, make sure you use collagen that uh, buys its collagen from a reputable manufacturer like Verisol or Peptan, which are uh, manufacturers of collagen uh, that have done a lot of scientific studies. Uh, so that way you know that the collagen is very high quality and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So, uh, and also you are, besides this longevity, uh, uh, supplements for skin health. There are also, um, uh, let's say, micro, other micronutrients, health supplements that are good for skin health, but all of them we discussed earlier. Uh, so these are things you need to take anyway, but these are some examples of some supplements that are needed uh, or that can really contribute to proper uh, skin health. And by this, uh, I would like to end this presentation uh, we unfortunately, due to lack of time, we will uh, skip the hair graying part, but uh, there is a blog post or an extensive article on how to mitigate hair graying or slow it down on our, uh, on our blog. Uh, but very quickly, conclusion, um, ideally we take both uh, supplements and follow a healthy diet. It's not one or the other. Uh, even if you eat healthy, you still need supplements, as we uh, explained. Um, supplements are very complex. Uh, it's not properly taught of medical school, so most doctors, yeah, are not very well versed in it, and uh, pe people are on their own, unfortunately. Um, government recommendations are often outdated and based on crude science, so they don't really tell us much about the ideal amounts for a long, healthy life. Um, a multivitamin, as we have seen, does not really suffice. Doses are too low, wrong forms, and so on. So therefore, uh, a multi-layered approach is ideal. And by this, uh, I would like to end our presentation about health supplements and longevity supplements. And hopefully this was useful uh, for you to see what uh, are the best ways uh, to take uh, those two kinds of supplements for optimal health and longevity. Thank you for your uh, uh, patience and attention. And uh, I, hand, uh, oh, I hand it over to you. If you have any questions, uh, we would be happy to answer them. Wow, thank you for that wow, wonderful you. presentation. It was very insightful. I know I have a bunch of questions. We also have a bunch of questions in the chat. Before we get started on those, I wanted to remind everyone that you can upvote your favorite question and that will help guide us in which questions to answer first. So the first question that we have, Dr. Verber, is can you please address the lithium and magnesium levels? Is it safe to take every day? Yeah, regarding magnesium, we need quite high amounts, ideally like 300, 400, 500 milligrams per day. Um, it's very difficult to get those amounts, even if you eat very healthy. You really have to eat a lot of nuts and green leafy vegetables and beans, etc., to really get uh, so much uh, magnesium. So that's uh, uh, so. Therefore, uh, eating a healthy diet containing the, the, the foods I just described uh, and taking a supplement on top of that with extra magnesium is interesting. And there have been done a lot of trials showing that if people take extra magnesium uh, as a supplement on, on top of their food. Uh, they have uh, less DNA damage, um, they have a better metabolism, uh, and so on. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, mineral. And uh, most people in the West, uh, some studies say 70% or 75% of people are deficient in magnesium intake. So it's uh, very important. Um, then about lithium, uh, we talk about microdose lithium. Uh, so there are a lot of studies showing that microdose lithium can extend lifespan, slow down aging, uh, has neuroprotective effects. Um, we see in regions where there is uh, more lithium in the drinking water, uh, there is less mortality and uh, less suicide risk and so on. Magnesium is used in medical practice in very high doses to mitigate bipolar disorder. But then we speak of doses that are 120 times higher than uh, what we have in novels. It's called microdose lithium. And that's a whole other, uh, let's say, thing than uh, the lithium that's provided in clinical trials. Uh, but even there, we also see that people taking these high doses uh, of lithium in, uh, in a medication setting 
uh, do have uh, less Alzheimer's disease and so on. But even very interestingly, the low dose, the micro dose of lithium can uh, uh, yeah, improve brain aging and uh, uh, slow down aging in general. Uh, there have been done clinical trials in humans with microdose lithium, and they do see that uh, yeah, it can slow down uh, progress of Alzheimer's disease and so on, uh, on condition, of course, you take it long enough. Uh, so six months, uh, uh, ideally longer, uh, and then uh, we see clinical trials uh, effects on, on uh, brain aging and uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases. Um, so I hope that explains that, that question a little bit. Thanks for sharing. That was very insightful. We have a question in the chat. It says, Dr. Verber opened with this. The study into nutrients to fight aging is very new, young, and crude. Yet he now advertises all these new micronutrients and additional intake of minerals. My question is, how can you, Dr. Verber and Novos, be sure? If it works in mice and various species, how can we be sure it works in the long run for Homo sapiens? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, first about uh, the health supplements like magnesium, vitamin D, vitamin K, there are a lot of uh, trials done in humans uh, showing that uh, vitamin D intake can uh, mitigate the risk of uh, specific diseases and so on. Same for magnesium, as I just explained. Um, uh, we all know that these vitamins and minerals, when delivered in proper doses and forms, uh, can yeah, uh, enable health effects. Eh? That's why governments recommend them. Uh, whether it's in the right doses is another thing, but they really uh, recommend to make sure you take these uh, vitamins and minerals uh, sufficiently through healthy food. Uh, and if, uh, if that's not possible um, through supplements, uh, we think, yeah, uh, given foods are so devoid of all these micronutrients, or, uh, or even if you eat healthy, you don't get a high enough amounts, so as we just explained. Um, that's why we um, uh, would say that uh, uh, supplementation is, uh, is very recommended. And then about longevity uh, supplements, um, well, it's, it's just uh, a lot of those supplements have already uh, very interesting data behind them. And um, they're also very safe, eh? like glucosamine has been taken already for many, many decades, and we don't see severe side effects. So these are like super safe uh, ingredients or supplements. Um, so actually the trade-off is very beneficial. Uh, you, uh, you can take uh, these specific health supplements uh, with very little risk of side effects uh, that are very safe and, and have been tried and all, often been taken already for a long time in humans, um, while you can have the benefit that it can yeah, extend your lifespan and so on. And, um, and we do see, for example, uh, so we have actually a whole article on why uh, we pick those ingredients and our scientific rationale behind them. Um, and so we look at ingredients that can uh, extend lifespan in multiple species um, that have been uh, known to have health effects in humans uh, that are known uh, to be taken for decades in humans like glucosamine or alpha ketoglutarate, uh, glycine. Uh, these supplements are around for a very long time. So we also know they are very safe. Um, and uh, we also base ourselves on studies uh, showing that they can uh, mitigate hallmarks of aging or that um, they have been associated with reduced mortality in humans. Uh, like I mentioned, glucosamine, uh, there have been done studies in the US and in Europe showing that it's one of the very little uh, supplements associated with reduced uh, mortality or cardiovascular diseases uh, in humans. So these are a few reasons uh, why we uh, uh, believe that these are, are very promising uh, and interesting ingredients for longevity and uh, optimal health. That was a great question paired with a great answer. Thank you, Dr. Verber. We have a question about hair. Um, the question is, I'm wondering if you have any updates with respect to supplements to combat hair loss. In particular, what do you make of these studies on pumpkin seed oil as a supplement or topical? Would simply eating pumpkin seeds be promoting, be a promising strategy? Thank you. Now for hair loss, I think we should do a, also a, a whole uh, webinar about that, uh, about hair loss and hair grain and so on. It's very interesting. Um, so we, we saw, by the way, that in these mice studies that alpha ketoglutarate, uh, calcium alpha ketoglutarate, by the way, was used in the studies, not just a, a plain normal alpha ketoglutarate, uh, because various reasons for that. But uh, they, we saw in studies that uh, calcium alpha ketoglutarate uh, also reduced hair go, uh, loss in mice. 
uh, and also hair graying mice. So that's why AKG could be an interesting supplement. Um, we have also an uh, article on, on hair loss on our, on our blog. Um, we do see that sometimes hair loss is induced by uh, uh, two uh, things actually. Uh, so if you eat a lot of animal protein that stimulates a lot of pro-aging pathways like mTOR, EGF, e, uh, and insulin pathways and so on, that um, you can uh, accelerate hair loss. And that's often why we see that bodybuilders or these people that follow paleo diets uh, or diets with a lot of uh, animal protein actually are bald. Uh, so they have uh, a bald head. And it's because they overstimulate these pro-aging pathways that lead to uh, stem cell decline uh, in the follicles uh, that uh, uh, generate hair uh, uh, growth. Uh, and also they have a, often uh, more testosterone and so on, which also accelerates aging, by the way, too much testosterone, but also leads to uh, hair loss, especially the hydrotestosterone. So, th and the other group that often uh, has to deal with hair loss are uh, people that uh, are deficient in micronutrients, especially vegetarians. So I often see vegetarians that uh, lose their hair uh, because uh, yeah, they are deficient in micronutrients that are needed for proper hair maintenance, like uh, iron, omega-3 fatty acids, zinc, copper, et cetera. And uh, they think, well, I take a B, vitamin B12 supplement, so I'm good as a vegetarian. But as we have seen, it's very complicated uh, and you really have to make sure you pro those uh, properly and then so on. So there's a second group and uh, so it's very funny because the the people who eat a lot of meat they say yeah you get bold because you're a vegetarian and the vegetarians they say oh yeah you get bold because you eat too much meat so and they, they're both right you know so anyway um so i think food is very important to follow a longevity diet uh, that doesn't contain too much but also not too little uh proteins that also uh, uh, delivers all the micronutrients you need and that can slow down uh baldness uh, there is, of course, a genetic component. Um, sometimes they say it runs in the family, but perhaps also because the father eats unhealthy. So he became bald very soon or very quickly. And then the son also, because yeah, often parents, uh, they, you inherit your food pattern, pattern from your parents. So but there's a lot of discussion. Uh, but I think longevity diet uh, can be interesting and in making sure you have all your micronutrients. And then there are uh, like simple things uh, uh, like minoxidil. It's uh, uh, something you can put on your head that induces hair growth a little bit, but uh, it's quite expensive actually. But we do see that caffeine, uh, so uh, solutions with caffeine on your hair uh, can also improve uh, follicle growth. Uh, um, so, uh, but you have to do it regularly, uh, twice per day for at least six months to start to see an effect. So a lot of people, they do uh, put a bit of minoxidil or caffeine solution on their head. And after a, few, a month or two, they don't see any difference. Well, the follicle uh, turnover, is very slow. So you have to do it uh, like at least six months to a year to start to see a uh, potential uh, effect. But it's also not magic bullets, but these are some things that can mitigate. But let's do also an, an, another webinar about this, uh, including skin health and so on. Great, thanks for sharing. We're just about to wrap up. I think we have time for two more questions, if that's all right with Dr. Verber. Definitely. Great. The question is, in your opinion, how does Nowells and Boost stack up against Dr. David Sinclair's updated longevity supplement routine? In addition, has Dr. David Sinclair recommended Novos or commented about Novos publicly? Yeah, a great question. So David Sinclair is, is someone we follow closely. He's a Harvard professor that's very well known for uh, research into aging, especially uh, certain NAD metabolism. Um, we do follow a lot of other uh, interesting uh, aging and longevity professors, of course, uh, but he's, uh, he's uh, very well known. He, he also has written a book called Lifespan, um, and uh, it's an interesting book. Uh, by the way, we have an article also on our website relisting the best longevity books, and uh, his book is one of those. Um, but yeah, uh, a lot of supplements that David Sinclair takes is, uh, are, are, uh, are also found in novels. Uh, uh, so far, he takes fisetine, at least uh, if we go uh, on his latest blog interviews, um, that's something we put in novels, uh, but that's also something he takes. Uh, so like we do discuss it during this presentation, uh, uh, that's uh, fisetine. Um, he uh, recommends taking res uh, resveratrol. Uh, we use pterostil B, which is very similar to resveratrol, um, but uh, we think that the pterostil B is more interesting than resveratrol because it's better absorbed and it's more stable in the body. 
Um, and uh, uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, he also takes NMN, uh, not NR, by the way, it's a whole discussion, NMN versus on NR, but he uh, takes NMN and we agree with that. We think also that NMN is uh, more interesting uh, than NR very likely because of the extra phosphate group on it. Um, but um, yeah, we, the, a lot of ingredients in Novos are uh, ingredients that David Sinclair also takes uh, or, uh, or would recommend um, in that regard. Uh, regarding the last part of your question, has he uh, publicly endorsed Novos? Uh, not to our knowledge, but I, I, I definitely has endorsed uh, some ingredients in Novos, uh, that's for sure. And he takes them himself. Great, thank you for sharing. All right, for our last question, we have a question about fertility. And it is, is there any information on the effectiveness of NMN and Novos in preserving female fertility or any other longevity intervention? Yeah, there are studies showing that uh, NMN can improve fertility in animals. Um, so there was a study uh, in cell, uh, I believe, uh, not uh, too long ago, that uh, showed that uh, NMN can improve fertility in uh, old uh, mice. Uh, they are also tested in other animals like horses. So uh, old horses, when they get uh, NMN, delivered orally, by the way, so not sublingually or intravenously or intraperitoneally, but orally it uh, also improved uh, uh, significantly uh, the fertility in these old horses uh, because the NMN uh, can uh, epigenetically reprogram somewhat or stabilize the epigenome and the DNA. And uh, it's very interesting. When we get older, um, NAD levels decline and you need NMN uh, to increase those NAD levels. And um, so there are definitely studies showing uh, um, fertility effects in old animals in different species, which are very highly suggested also will work for humans. Uh, and actually there are some uh, case studies, uh, even Professor David Sinclair wrote in his book that uh, a woman who uh, passed menopause, uh, who started to take NMN, uh, started to ovulate again. Uh, so she became uh, fertile again, which is actually quite remarkable. And it's very interesting because the oocytes, so the egg cells, um, they need, uh, they, they are very prone to aging. Uh, so they are very fast aging uh, tissues and they are very stem cell-like, by the way. One uh, oocyte, when fertilized, can create a whole human being consisting of 40,000 billion cells, which is absolutely amazing. So the DNA and epigenome needs to be maintained very well. And it's interesting that uh, a, a supplement like NMN can, uh, can have these uh, effects. So uh, there are definitely uh, studies uh, demonstrating an impact of NMN uh, on, uh, on uh, fertility. Great, thanks for sharing. I'm going to quickly answer a question about the availability of this presentation. We are recording this webinar and it will be available at a later date to view. And that's all we have time for today. Before we sign off, I wanted to let you know that you can ask us questions anytime. We have a link in our Instagram bio called Ask Novos Anything. I'm actually going to drop the link in the chat here right now. And at this link, you can ask us any longevity, biohacking, health, wellness, and fitness related questions. We'll do our best to answer these questions during events like today, across social media, email, and more. So if your question wasn't answered today, it would be a great idea to go to that link and drop your question in there, and we will try to get to it at a later date. I'm also going to add the link to our blog in the chat. Great, wonderful. So everyone, thank you for your attention and thank you for the great questions. And we look uh, definitely forward uh, to seeing you uh, during another webinar. Uh, we really enjoy doing those. And uh, yeah, we're happy to, to spread the knowledge about longevity and health. Um, so I just want to personally also thank you. So, and also uh, many thanks for uh, our great host. Thank you very much. And I just added the blog in the chat. If you want to learn more about how to live younger for longer, we have over a hundred articles with scientific references covering all topics of longevity. So that is a great resource to look at. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you or having you at more events like this in the future. Bye.